Welcome back to Two Keto Dudes. This is Carl Franklin from Connecticut in the United States. And in February of 2016, I put myself on a ketogenic diet to take control of my metabolism. In just two and a half months, I managed to reverse all my markers of type 2 diabetes with diet alone. As of now, I'm 80 pounds lighter with no signs of diabetes or heart disease. Hi, I'm Richard Morris in Canberra, Australia. I've been on a ketogenic diet since April of 2014. When I started, I was very sick with complications from type 2 diabetes. Within six months of starting a ketogenic diet, all of my biomarkers of disease had disappeared. I've lost about 100 pounds. I've completely turned my health around. And this show is a document of my progress through ketosis and Richard's experience thriving for years in ketosis. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Hopefully that might help a few people who are curious about this kind of dietary hacking. Yeah, we're not doctors, we don't want to give anyone any medical advice, but we are keen to share our own experiences. We're actually both software developers, so we're not afraid of a little technical detail, are we, Carl? You bet your life. (laughs) We've done some research into our own deranged metabolisms and the science behind them, and we hope to share some of that research. Where possible, we intend to put links in the show notes to cite research supporting any claims that we make. And you'll probably work out pretty quickly that we're both foodies. Oh, yeah. We love to cook and we love to eat. Sure do. In every episode, we both share a keto recipe that cannot be ignored. I dare you. (laughs) (laughs) All right, man. Let's start podcast number 91. Tim Noakes. We're We're not not worthy. worthy. We're We're not not worthy. worthy. (laughs) (laughs) We're just a I can't believe uh, Tim wants to talk to us. I know. Before we start, do we have any apologies or corrections from last week's show? Um, I I refuse to apologize for Karen Ogilvie. <laughs> 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 she did awesome. So She was great. Mm-hmm. Our audio was not the best because we recorded in a hotel room near an airport, but it was uh, uh, her content was great, yep. Yeah. Well, let's revisit what a ketogenic diet is. Sure thing. We use... Uh, a guideline of 20 grams of carbohydrates or less per mm-hmm. day. Yep. As for protein, it's moderate, yep. one to one and a half grams of protein for every kilogram of lean body mass. Yep. And the rest of our energy we get from fat. Fat. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> the fat on your plate or the fat from that Krispy Kreme donut you ate a decade ago. Exactly. Yeah. Well, how was your week, Richard? Uh, it was interesting. <laughs> so- we got a dog. We got a new dog. Um, it, it, yeah. He's a blue healer. He's mostly blue healer with a little bit of, I guess, Rottweiler. Uh, he's got like a, like a really broad head and very large wow. feet. And he's about 10 months old. We got him from a, the pound. He's a pound puppy. Uh-huh. Uh, he was a rescue. And he'd been handed in because he was destructive. <laughs> and the family who had oh. him couldn't. Couldn't deal with him, and we found we found out exactly how destructive he was. So oh, to, man. today we went out to Costco, and we uh, we left him for about an hour, and we came home, <laughs> and uh, all of the he he chewed through a basket that one of our other dogs used to sleep in. So literally mm. pulled an entire wicker basket into straws about two or three inches long. The entire thing oh. <laughs> destructed. Yeah. He, he moved a <laughs> freezer full of food about three foot across the floor. Uh, what? He, yeah, he piled every single shoe in the house uh, into a big <laughs> pile in the middle of our bed. And <laughs> oh, there was, I mean, it was amazing. It was, look. I, I, I wanted to be mad, but it was just so amazing. I just, I just couldn't. Right. <laughs> so yeah, you're going to have to harness that for the powers of good somehow. <laughs> so <laughs> he's going to be a big challenge. So that's that's been my week. I've also had some dental surgery, so my mouth is a little bit yeah, sore I noticed today. You're missing a tooth there, buddy. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting an implant done. So uh, uh, oh. that's an interesting procedure. So um, mm. yeah, but uh, anyway, that's. Uh, uh, that's been my week. How was your week? Oh, it was good. Uh, I went to Las Vegas for a conference. Nice. And a software development conference that I do every year down there. Mm-hmm. And I got to have lunch with Dave Feldman, which was great. That's school was good, yeah. Yeah. And guess what he talked about? I'll give you one guess. Carbs. 
<laughs> lipids. Lipids. <Yeah. laughs> he's an amazing guy. Yeah, he absolutely is. He's on this uh, this bend right now where he's eating carbs for science, and he's hating himself, right. and he's got him little pot yep. belly, and he's he, he's had to lower the number of calories that he's he's eaten every day because when he yeah. maintained the same amount of caloric intake, uh, he was putting on weight. So uh, yeah, he's right. he's not a happy chap. No. Well, we'll hear from him more in the future, yeah. I'm pretty sure. Uh, I also have been, you know, editing podcasts and mm. I was, I was, I've been doing a lot more of that than I, than I was, uh, a few weeks ago. Yeah. Obviously we, we've got a couple new podcasts out. Yeah. The Obesity Code podcast with Jason Fung and Megan Ramos. Yeah. Uh, and you can get that at obesitycodepodcast.com mm-hmm. or just your favorite podcast client, iTunes, whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, that podcast quickly shot up the charts. Yeah. And I believe at one point it was number three. Wow. I'm not sure where it is right now, but it was number yeah. three in health and fitness. Uh, it's different than what you're used to. It's a little more um, story crafted yeah. and narrated. And uh, you f- there isn't a free form conversation like we have here. Right. It's more like uh, an NPR radio lab or This American Life. Um, you hear from patients and you hear from uh, Dr. Fung and Megan and a whole panel of experts, including our guest today, Tim Noakes. That's so right. I've been having a lot of fun editing that, and you and I have been working close together on the oh, yeah. the story arcs and the and and uh, it's just been great. Yeah. It's if you're used to the stuff that we do, what we do really here is a conversation um, where uh, you know you're a virtual member of our conversation, but. Uh, mm-hmm. In the the obesity code uh, podcast, uh, yeah, it is a story. It's a narration, and we do a couple of versions of that where we do Q and A's with 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 Jason. So that's like a little departure yep. from our regular program. And we've done four patient stories, and of course the Q and A. Yep, it, very enjoyable. And the other thing that we've been doing is um, the Keto Woman podcast. Keto Woman, yeah, yeah. that's Daisy Daisy Brackenhall. Yeah, and she's just killing it. She's talking to all these amazing women about their experiences filling a much needed gap in the podcast landscape for for low carbers. Yeah, I I've got to admit I'm a really bad podcaster. I don't really care about where we are on the charts. I really don't pay much attention to it. But yeah. but like the first week that Daisy's podcast was out, she sends me this link and she says I'm number 99. And then like two, yeah. two days later she sends me another link saying I'm number 33. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. and uh, yeah, that's it, very exciting. It is very exciting. Yeah. So we've got three podcasts now, and we're working on a fourth. Yeah. Right. So Keto Families and Keto Kids mm. is uh, the next one that's going to come out. Yeah. And uh, we'll, we'll just get those done. So, Richard, the other thing I did just briefly, uh, you've heard me talk about music to code by. Yeah. Yeah. So this is uh, some popular music that I've written that helps you focus. And, and I originally wrote it for developers. And uh, I ended up using it in the Obesity Code podcast as sort of the the bed music beds. Mm. So a lot of people have been asking about it. I actually rebranded it as Music to Flow By, and now there's an app. So you can listen to 75 minutes of this music for free just by going to your app store and installing Music to Flow By. Nice. And uh, there's also subscription options. There's 13 tracks in the library now. There's a new one coming out every month. So I wanted to tell everybody just in case that they wanted to hear more of that. Awesome. Well, anyway, that was my week. I'm up to my ears in audio, and it's a lot of fun. (laughs) Awesome. And this is the point in the show where we give away some swag to a lucky member chosen at random mm-hmm. of our fan club, the two keto dudes fan club. Yeah. I know it's a little strange having a fan club, but you know, yeah. people asked for it. So yeah. if you go to fan club.2keto.com and sign up, a- answer a few questions every week, we pick a name out of the hat and mm-hmm. uh, give them a piece of swag. Yeah. And it's a coffee mug. Yeah. With our mugs on it. With our mugs on it. So today's winner is Dan Bruffy. Yep. Hey, congratulations, congratulations, Dan. Dan just won a coffee mug for being a member of the fan club. And if you don't want to wait to win a mug, you can always buy one at gear.2keto.com and pick yourself up a T-shirt while you're there. Absolutely. All right, then, that brings us to the segment we call... <laughs> what you got, mate? 
Mail, mail, mail. All right. Well, as people probably know by now, we used to read emails, but now that we have this great forum, the Ketogenic Forums, there's over 10,000 people in there. You can go there, forum.2keto.com. Right. We usually now pick a, a message that somebody has put in the forum, and this is a thread that is really amazing. It's called uh, Who Saved Your Life? And it was started by Goal 179. And Goal 179 says, Do you feel like keto saved your life? If not your physical life, then the quality of your life? If so, I would like to open this post up to everyone to shout out the person by name who hooked you on keto. Was it a doctor? A best friend? Let's use this form to say thank you to the person who introduced you to keto. I will start. My buddy Paige was the person who pushed me to keto. I had not seen her in a few months, and I was amazed when I saw her weight loss. I just couldn't accept that she'd done it naturally. There was no way that she could have lost over 80 pounds naturally in just 11 months. Right. While I had been killing myself for four years and kept losing and gaining the same 23 pounds over and over with no net success. Mm. I privately accused her of having bariatric surgery or being on some <laughs> medication that helped her lose weight. One day I begged her to tell me what she was doing to be so successful. She was extremely hesitant because she was afraid that I would judge her or challenge her in some way. When she finally told me what she was doing, I was immediately intrigued. I started researching everything I could about keto. I was hesitant to start it until the keto group on my fitness pal suggested listening to two keto dudes. Wow. I didn't even know we were mentioned yeah, wow. on there. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and she says, at that point, I was hooked. My wonderful, skinny, beautiful friend Paige has also been very supportive throughout the entire process. She checks in with me often, and she keeps me motivated. My keto way of eating has taken on a life of its own that is far beyond what Paige did during her journey. I now know about extended fasting and intermittent fasting, autophagy, and reversing prediabetes. It's because of Paige that I am where I am today. So thank you, Paige. And I also want to thank Richard and Carl for giving me the courage to try this. 50 pounds down and only 60 more to go. You saved my life. Wow. Toast to Paige. <laughs> well well yeah. done, Goal 179, and well done, Paige, for uh, paying it forward. Uh, I, I guess um, I want to say that the person who uh, who got me to keto – was uh, this was actually YouTube by Professor Noakes, who's our guest today, and That's right. he did a YouTube where he spoke about uh, his epiphany and the fact that he originally thought this whole keto low carb thing was a bit of a fad until he saw that there were serious uh, scientists behind it, and so I followed him to Steve Finney and Jeff Volek and Eric Westman, mm. and that's how I got into the whole thing. So uh, you know, I'm I just want to. Uh, to, uh, to to toast Tim Noakes and thank him for for that. And I want to thank you, buddy, because you are the one who got me into it. So <laughs> thank you. Hey, you're welcome. <laughs> yeah. My hope for everybody is that one day you will see your own name in a thread like this as the inspiration for somebody to save their own life. And you know, because this is really how we're going to save this world exponentially. Each of us are going to take responsibility for our friends and family, get them yep. on board, because you know. If you have type 2 diabetes, then there's a good chance that your family members may have it as well um, and right. uh, or they're somewhere on that progression. And uh, my hope is that, uh, you know, that if we all take responsibility for two people, this whole thing will grow exponentially. And if we take responsibility yep. for more than two, uh, it will go even faster. So, And it, hopefully it will grow faster than the people who are trying to stop it from happening. Agreed. And by the way, this thread just keeps growing. People are, uh, you know, telling their stories and thanking their mentors. And uh, if if you want to throw your hat in the ring, just go to uh, forum.2keto.com and uh, register yep. and look for the thread called Who Saved Your Life? Awesome. So, Richard, what do you got? So, I've got a message here also in the forum. This is from John B. Uh, and uh, he says... Uh, I made my goal weight. That's the title of his message. And he says, hey, everybody, back in March 2017, my wife said she wanted to try a low-carb, high-fat diet, and she wanted me to do it with her. I'd put on a few pounds just north of 200. <laughs> Ouch. Oh. And I I'm assuming he means he was just north of 200 pounds rather than he yeah. put on just north of 200 pounds. Right. Uh, and I was no longer happy with the way that I looked in the mirror. 
I first set a small goal, losing 20 pounds, so that according to the BMI scale, I was no longer considered obese. I made yeah. that, and then I made another goal to see if I could make it to 150. I'm happy to say that when I got on the scale this morning, it said I was 149.5 pounds. Nice. Well done. Uh, he says, I had stalled at 155 pounds for quite some time, but I was happy with the way I felt. But I had made a mental goal to reach 150, so I did not give up. I will continue to eat low-carb, high-fat, as I like the way that it makes me feel. Uh, and as I get older, I want to stay healthy. So for those who are still reaching for your goal weight, don't give up. It will happen. Yes. Well done. That's awesome. Congratulations. Yep. Congratulations to you. Mm. It's just amazing that we hear the same story over and over and over again, you know, from people, uh, the, the way that they had been thinking about losing weight. Right. And, you know, getting the sort of revelation of low carbs and actually having the courage to, to, to lean into it with, yeah. with full gusto. And that whole keep calm and keto on thing really, really does work for people because, you know, they, they lose yeah. a lot of weight very quickly and then they start to, that, Weight loss starts to slow down as their body has gotten rid of all of its uh, uh, the majority of the weight that it considered excess, and now it's just got yeah. you know uh, uh, sort of resources, and now it's uh, it's determining what it's going to do with those resources and how much it needs. It takes a little bit of time, and the the more deranged you are, the longer time it takes, but it will yep. happen. It's just the way it works. Yeah, yeah. Well, that brings us to our guest today, our esteemed guest is Professor Tim Noakes. Heard you say you do for a little. Prof, tell us about your epiphany. Where did this low-carb adventure of yours begin? Well, Richard, it began on the 12th of December, 2010. <laughs> <laughs> wow, well, that's precise. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So that shows how important it was to me. So that was the day that I finished off a book called Waterlogged and sent it off to my publishers and it was a 30-year odyssey proving that you right. could drink too much during exercise and problems could develop. And anyway, uh, when I'd finished, I hadn't been running enough in the last month or two or perhaps even longer. And I went to bed that night and my brain woke me up and said, you've got to get up tomorrow morning and run at six o'clock and you must run every day for the rest of your life. So, of course, <laughs> yeah. I listened to my instructions and I went out. I had a dreadful run. I came home. And I opened my emails, and there was an advert for a book called The New Atkins for the New You. Right. Written by three, three guys, Westman, Foley, Volick, and Finney. And I said, what a disgrace. Uh, These guys have sold <laughs> out to Atkins. Right, yeah. And I said, right. it's unbelievable. I really trusted them as good scientists, and now they've sold out. And then my brain said to me, now, hold on, what happens if they're right? <laughs> so I said, oops, I better be <laughs> <laughs> So I went straight down to the bookshop. I bought the book. And within two hours, I realized that for 33 years, I'd got it wrong and I'd been given the wrong advice. Wow. So I decided to experiment on myself. I had an incredibly good result. Then I discovered that I had type 2 diabetes because of my family history. My dad died of the disease. Right. And then I realized that, you know, I was going to go the same way unless I did something. And so I embraced the low-carb diet and benefited enormously from it and then I started writing about it, and slowly people in South Africa realized that I'd changed. They wanted to know why, and uh, I had to explain, and then the attack started. Right. <laughs> and, then, and so I've had six years of attacks. So that that brings us to the next point where, you know, it seems that you tweeted one day. Yeah, there's this <laughs> and, tweet. And then the dietetic world lost its mind. <laughs> Well, you know, what we've now know, you know, the beauty of having this trial, which went on for three years and having some really good lawyers involved was we managed to find out that this was a collusion between the Association of Dietetics of South Africa oh. and the Health Professional Council. Right. And what happened was we wrote a book called The Real Meal Revolution, and it clearly yeah. affected the dietitians. They started talking about the Tim Noakes problem long before there was any issue about a tweet. Yeah, And so we know that they were in collusion because we have emails going from one person to the other, from the person, from ADSA to the Health Professional Council, right? and saying, what are we going to do about the Tim Noakes problem? And it, it turned out that the tweet was a simply a, a good excuse to let's take him out on the tweet. 
But the, it was never about the tweet. It was about the impact of our book, The Real Meal Revolution, on their profession. Right. Wow. So they were concerned that, you know, for their jobs, for their, in, the incentive was monetary, in other words. That is correct. That's what I can assume. But you see, what happened was people started writing rude articles about them. And there was one particularly rude one, which was published two weeks before they decided to charge me or to complain about me. Right. And it was called Tim Noakes and BS, although the guy used the BS in complete words. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> he said, gosh, Tim Noakes has clearly made a big error. And so he went and investigated. He found out that I wasn't the one who'd made the error. It was the dietitians. Hmm. <laughs> and he kept, he would ask them questions. And he said, well, why is the Banting low-carb diet wrong? And they said, and they couldn't answer him. So he said, they're BSing. And so he wrote right. this long article. And mm -hmm. there were 140 responses, something like that, and most of them were antagonistic. And so that was what the real issue was. It wasn't the fact that I was tweeting about weaning babies onto high-fat diets. Right. They just needed an excuse. They, they, they saw this as an opportunity to cut the head off the snake, basically, by, by stopping you and therefore stopping the truth that was coming out. But, you know, other doctors especially have come out, you know, for – uh, this low carb thing, Eric Westman, Jeffrey Gerber, you know, and written books and talk about it all the time. And they don't have, they don't come under attack. What was it about your situation that made you particularly vulnerable to these people? I think because it was so successful. I mean, I think there was a major change in diets in South Africa. For example, we've got a Facebook page in Cape Town where I live which is a Banting seven-day meal plan Facebook page. It has one million members. Wow. It started wow. two years ago. <laughs> it grows by 3, 000, two to 3,000 people a day. Oh, my. That's how big the story is in South Africa. No wonder. And I think it, it just took – it was like a viral thing, and it just went mad. And I think that was what happened. Do you think that all these other people in, in, these, in the States and perhaps in Australia, maybe in the U.K., once the critical mass starts impacting people monetarily, and I'm talking about the dietitians and the pharmaceutical companies and the, you know, the diabetes engine and all of that, that more people will fall victim to this kind of thing? I suspect that there are slightly that Americans and Canadians may be a little more liberal and realize that there is a thing called free speech and that's what you're protecting. Yeah, yeah. I yeah, suspect yeah. that in this country, they didn't quite understand the free speech issue. And so they got around it. I, I, I would suspect that. I think that the, the US, you probably protect free speech more strongly than we do here. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that it doesn't really need the, the law is clearly on your side, right? So it yeah. all, uh, that doesn't stop people from making waves and trying to bring other people down. They, this is a very litigious society in the U.S. It happens all the time. But um, what, what I find interesting is that you beat it. I mean, you said, no, I'm not going to roll over. I'm bringing in the guns, <laughs> and, and here's the science, and it, it's irrefutable. Yeah. And, Carl, the reason I had to do that was because they targeted my entire career. Right. As I write in the book that was coming out next week, I was this famous world-class scientist. And then in a few weeks, I converted to this person who'd completely lost it. My descent into quackery, as I called it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I became targeted as a quack. It was unbelievable how quickly it happened. And it, there were, I mean, my own university distanced itself from me. Now, this is the university I've served mm. For 35 years, I'm one of their better scientists in their history, and they attack me. And the public can only think one thing, that I've lost it completely. Right. right. So I really never had any choice. I had to fight it. Yeah. But if, if you can get into so much trouble in 140 characters, just how, how much mischief can you get into writing an entire <laughs> book on nutrition? <laughs> yeah. That's a great question. Uh, uh, someone who, who read the book has said, well, you declared war. <laughs> I said, no, I, Good. <laughs> I didn't declare war. They declared war. And I'm just fighting back. And, you know, one of the features of this book is really funny because people, I'm fastidious in what I record. And so every letter sure. to the newspaper or article that was written about me or comment or scientific paper which attacked me over the last five years, I've got it there. 
in the book. And I say, well, this is what they said, and this is my position. So no yeah. one can ever accuse me of hiding behind something. Right, It's sure. all there. All the facts are there. And people can make up their own minds. And of course, in my opinion, I answer the arguments every time, and I win the arguments yeah. every time. Right, yeah. But now the public gets a chance to see, gosh, you know, when they the Heart Foundation says this about Noakes, actually they're wrong. That's not fair, what they've said. Or whatever, the health professional council or the ADSA, the dietitians, actually they're not they don't know what they're talking about. I, I've got to admit, I, I listened to the entire uh, trial through Marika's tweets and yeah. she did a wonderful job of covering it and then i voraciously consumed the vi any video that was taken of the entire thing and your presentation was remarkable you, you, it was like what 44 pages of testimony uh yeah it was i think you mean 40 hours of testimony yeah That's sorry 40 <laughs> hours of testimony mm, yeah. it was close to that and it was over mm. a thousand slides and <laughs> yeah <laughs> it was spread over nine days i i testified for five and a half days Wow. And then I was cross-examined for three and a half days. So, And then we had our three angels, we call them the angels, yeah. came out. Yeah. And they presented for three days total. That was Zoe and Nina and Karen Zen. Yeah. yeah. And um, th they're trying again, aren't they? Is, is there some sort of appeal happening now? Yeah, they, they're appealing the case. And <laughs> they've warned that they want to go the whole trial all over again. Oh, they, want to, they want to appoint another panel. And let's start all over again. Which it's is like Charlie Brown with the football. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And of course, they, you know, they didn't make it a case. There is no case. When you look right. logically, there is no case. Yeah. So they can have as many appeals as they like, but it's not going to happen. The only, they, the, the trouble is they're the judge and the jury. They set yeah. the committee. Mm. And if they get three dishonest doctors on that committee, well, then we could have a, it, I could lose the case. Well, just in the sheer number of studies that uh, fall in favor of a low-carbohydrate diet in just about any silo, right? And just in yeah. sheer numbers, if somebody wants to produce some bad science, yeah, there's one or two or three uh, manipulated uh, clinical uh, trials out there. And you know what they are, and you can look and see who paid for them and what their uh, – mm -hmm you know, what their uh, incentives were. But uh, you can't argue with the sheer number of of studies that have all shown, that, you know, for example, that saturated fat isn't harmful to you and all of the other silos that go into the low-carb benefit diet. No, precisely. And that we've tried to show in this in the book. And hopefully this will be the final answer. And maybe in South Africa, this will be a tipping point because now the public will see Okay, you tried to demonize him. It didn't work. He's right. You're mm. wrong. Let's mm. move on. It'd be nice if truth was the uh, final arbiter, wouldn't it? <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Unfortunately, as you know, it's not. Uh, so what's the name of your new book? It's called Law of Nutrition, Challenging Conventional Dietary Beliefs. Law, L-O-R-E. Yeah. L-O-R-E. It's, that it's is, a take uh, on law of running. In fact, we yeah. first called it the Omerta, Breaking the Omerta. <laughs> because that's what I think the secret society we, yes I think that's what we have in South Africa and medicine that that there is this emerita but then the book publisher said no that book will never sell then we called it nutrition on trial and the bookseller said no that'll never sell yeah so then in desperation like about six weeks ago they said okay it's law of nutrition to go with law of running you know, which is a great title. It really is. I just yeah, I have a, a personal thing I want to say to you, Professor, which is I really admire your um, your your demeanor in talking to the press yeah. and in talking to people. Yeah, so you always have a smile on your face when you talk to people. You're always, you know, you're never mean. You're always uh, just <laughs> presenting the facts and the facts speak for themselves. You know, there's a lot of meanness on Facebook and social media yeah. out there. So just, a, a you know, a, you're a role model for how all of us ought to be talking to people about uh, the low carbohydrate diet. Well, thank you. Thanks, Carl. Uh, let me just tell you that it's been tough the last three years. And my wife has been the one who's been saying, listen, you got to keep this attitude and don't get <laughs> angry and hostile. And I must so the fact is another... you're actually angry? <laughs> <laughs> so I must, uh, there's a guy called Malcolm Russell, who's a great friend now became, you know, a couple of people came towards me and saved my life. And he's one of them, and, and he's a coach, a television presenter coach. 
And he, he said, listen, he, he, he wrote to me and he said, Tim, there's a lot of trouble coming down the line for you. Hmm. I want to teach you how you handle it. So yeah. he took me aside and he produced a, a document. He showed me what I was doing. He asked me questions. And he said, Tim, this is where you're wrong. This is what you have to do. And it took me about 10 or 15 minutes to get it. And as soon as I got it, I was fine. But he certainly changed the way I was approaching it. He hit me at the time I was at my weakest and my worst. And I was really angry. Mm. And it, was, it reflected in the way I spoke to anyone and yeah. particularly to the media. So he was very, very helpful. And my wife was absolutely crucial too. Oh, that's great. <laughs> So I want to mention actually something personal. You, you mentioned that your epiphany, you know the date that it yeah. happened. And my first epiphany was watching a YouTube presentation that you gave on that story. And I, at that, I, I was actually type 2 diabetic first before I discovered a low-carb uh, approach and then, and then reversed my own type 2 diabetes. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, I, I've got to, I've, one, I've got to thank you for that. because And, and also Stephen Finney and Eric Westman because yeah. they'd also put content online and your uh, epiphany brought me to their science and to reading that. And I, I've actually just uh, decided to go back to university and I'm at 52 years old, an ex-diabetic. I'm going back to university. I found out yesterday that I've just been accepted to do a degree in biochemistry, which I'm really Fantastic. looking forward to yeah. doing. So uh, I just want to thank you for, awesome. for getting me to that place where I could turn back my diabetes and start helping people like Carl mm. and then the thousands of people we talk to on online. And now I want to get into – I want to actually do some research. That's where I'm heading. Fantastic. Well done, and thanks for that story. It, it makes it all worthwhile, you know, that – People ask, why do you keep going? And the answer is because I know how many people have been helped Yeah, in, in a real way, in a life-changing way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, I gave a talk, uh, we, we talked uh, last week in Natal, mm -hmm. South Africa, and uh, a guy, the first guy got up, he said, listen, I lost 50 kilograms and I stopped <laughs> taking 20 medications, wow. 20 medications. Yeah, wow. outstanding. And I don't need any of it. I mean, that when you see that, yeah. And that is so influential. I must tell you, you know, you ask when I became convinced. Well, it was watching Mark Sisson's website. He had this enormous guy. He was looked okay. like he weighed about well well over 120, 140 kilograms or 260 sure. more pounds. Yeah. And then and then he looked like an American football player. At the end, he looked unbelievable. He was ripped completely. Hmm. Wow. And I said, It's impossible. You can't be do that. Right, and he did it, and I thought, well, if he can do it, then, then there's no reason why we can't all do it. Yeah, I've yeah. gone from 150 kilograms down to 103. Um, yeah, I'm uh, I'm still I'm still considered overweight, but I'm also quite solid. I, my yeah. my father was a, a played representative rugby, and so I I, I had that <laughs> in my genes. And I, I've got to say, I, I've got to I've got to ask you a question on his behalf. He'd never forgive me if I didn't ask uh, yeah. this question of one of the world's premier sports medicine researchers. What can we do about the All Blacks? <laughs> <laughs> a million people just said, what the heck are they talking about? Yeah, yeah. well, it's a problem. I was at, fortunate to be at the – because my the doctor with the All Blacks is my former student of mine. Oh, okay. And the physiotherapist, <laughs> would you believe it, did re we did research with him on waterlogged, on the overdrinking. Oh, wow. <laughs> so when he was in Cape Town recently, he gave me tickets to the rugby. And no one in South Africa ever gives me tickets. So anyway, we went to the rugby and it was a fabulous game. And the All Blacks won by one point. Oh. And, in, and in fact, I think the, I think South Africa deserved to win that one. And of course, Australia won on, on Friday or on Saturday last week. Yeah, yeah. We got to mention that the All Blacks are like the winningest rugby team in New Zealand, right? In history, yeah. I think. In, in history. history. And they're all low carb. They're definitely low sugar. Mm -hmm. uh, but their coach, not the coach, sorry, the fitness consultant is absolutely low, co low carbs. Okay. He's totally committed. And in fact, he comes from the center where Corin Zinn works in Auckland. Right. And, and she was influential in converting the whole department to the low <laughs> carbs. And she tells the story because she, she, I taught her in 1990s. And of course, she would have had the high carbs. But her professor yeah. Said, you know, there's a whole story about the low carbs. I said, it's a lot of rubbish, but Karen, will you go and look into it? <laughs> so she said, well, of course I know it's rubbish. I'll go and look into it. And after like about a month, she came back and she said, Grant, I'm sorry, there's something in it. Oh, and she, she turned got, Grant Schofield. She, she got, turned Grant Schofield. <laughs> uh, wow. 
<laughs> wow. Oh, well, I, I owe her even more then. <laughs> uh, and then, unfortunately, he converted the, the All Blacks as well. But yeah. Right, right. <laughs> Well, anyway, I, I, they're, they're wonderful to watch, and if you know if it's low carb, then uh, all power to them. <laughs> exactly. Well, we have some more specific nutrition questions to ask you that we could uh, just let you answer. And uh, sure, uh, do you mind? Uh, no, of course, ready to answer anything. Can't you simply exercise to counteract a bad diet? Well, I thought I could, and so I ran seventy marathons and ultra marathons in my life, and I noticed that. After the age of about 50, I started getting progressively heavier. And of course, you get as you get heavier, it's more difficult to run. So you, your calories out going down, but the calories in seems to go up. And I discovered that as soon as I changed to the low-carb diet, my weight just dropped off. Um, I lost 11 kilos in the first eight weeks, which is, which is a good result. And I've, I've lost up to 21 kilograms total. But And it had nothing to do with the exercise because the amount of energy you expend during exercise is so trivial compared to how easy it is to put those calories into your mouth. And, and the key, I'd say, about obesity is obesity is a disease of hunger. And that's the key. You've got to treat the hunger. And as soon as you get your brain working properly, and so the apostat in the brain is working properly, and you're not always hungry you will start eating the appropriate amount of calories and you'll lose the weight. So I think that's crucial. And, you know, it's really funny because Zoe Hardcom, who I've got such a great respect for, she, she's written a, a blog this last week and she said, you know what people forgot when they said you burn so many calories during exercise, they forgot to subtract the number of calories you would normally send if you were just sitting in your chair. Right. And if you subtract your resting metabolic rate, from the amount of calories you suppose you expend during exercise, it's even smaller. <laughs> and she gives this example of some children who they would had an experiment and one cola drink and they had to run for an hour and a half to spend all the, the calories. And that, that's the reality. Sure, so obesity wow. is a problem of hunger and you treat the hunger not by running more because you get more hungry. <laughs> I, it, it is true. You can. I could control my weight, which was really interesting. I'm profoundly insulin resistant. In fact, so bad that I've got data back to my, when I was 28 and running marathons and I was relatively lean. And I had a fasting insulin of 40 units, which is eight times normal. Yeah. That's how insulin resistant I was. But I was running. but And I found that if I ran more than two hours a day, like 14 hours a week, then I could lose weight. Why? Because I was burning off all these extra carbohydrate calories. Yeah. But mm -hmm. I had to get up to two hours a day before I was in balance, carbohydrate balance, right. and I could lose weight. And that's the problem. You have to yeah. burn so you have to do so much exercise to burn off those ridiculous carbohydrate calories. And I do want to make another point that you know, this mm. diet, the low carb diet, is actually it's low carb, it's exactly the same amount of protein as you always ate, and it's exactly the same as fat that you always ate. And we forget to make that point. Mm. It's not a high fat diet. You just continue mm. to eat exactly the amount of fat that you did. Right, sure. That point is not made. So all you're doing on this diet is you're cutting out the rubbish carbs, which are nutrient poor. Yeah. And those are the ones you have to burn to try and exercise. You have to try and burn those ones off. So when we go on this diet, we actually just cut that carbs, and then we can burn the fat in our body, and that's how we can lose the weight. Right. So you're dining on fat. You're eating fat, and you're also eating body fat. Uh, that's so correct. There's a, another question about athletic performance. We talked to uh, a guy who's a, a cyclist, cycles all over the UK, and uh, he was saying that performance, endurance goes up on a low-carb diet, but performance may go down, or you don't his, get the performance. Power. Yeah, he, power. He, he, he instruments his power, and he noticed that he had a slight drop in power. Versus, you yeah, know. Yeah, no, and I think that's probably correct. I don't... It's not been scientifically proven. And I've actually just come from a conference where my team presented on low-carb diets. And we had a world-class triathlete there who'd converted. And we, in fact, did an experiment on him. And we did show that if he ate a little more carbohydrates, his power over 20 kilometers went up. But on 100 kilometers, it went down. So that was the interesting thing, <laughs> that by increasing his carbs, he went down. And he, but what was really interesting, he's, He's got the highest rates of fat oxidation we've ever measured. 
at 90% of his VO2 max, he was burning 1.85 grams of fat per minute. Yikes. Wow. Those those are unbelievable. At 90%. So this guy does an Ironman and he burns fat the whole way. And if he was doing it at 90%, he'd also be burning fat. And the reason why the carbohydrate impacted on his performance over 100 Ks was because it reduced his fat oxidation. Sure. So, So, yeah. Yeah. That, that, so that's, that's, is that higher than the uh, figures that Jeff Follick found in the FASTA study? That they may well have had one or two at that have value. Right. But he was generally with about 1.6. And this wow. guy was 1.85. But, and the key was at 90% of his VO2 max. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he's just yes, a fat sure. burning machine. He just he doesn't need carbs. <laughs> we should get him on the podcast sometime and have a chat to him because that's, that's yeah. very interesting. What do you tell to these weightlifters and people doing high-intensity uh, workouts that swear that they need to have carb up days or carb loading? What do you tell well, them? Well, the answer is on the high-fat diet, you, you do store glycogen in the muscles. You, you score about half a month that Jeff's study was wrong, and I was a reviewer of it, and I told Jeff he was wrong in the, mm-hmm. the faster paper because there was an error on one of their measurements and it was the glycogen stored at the start of exercise that uh, we've studied it it's usually half and and you can only explain what we find if the glycogen's down by half but the point is there's plenty of glycogen there and therefore for some weightlifting i don't know half an hour's weightlifting there may well be enough glycogen that's point one and the other point is another study out from new zealand where they had people sprint and they showed that the ones who were the best sprinters were the ones who burnt the most fat whilst they were sprinting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. <laughs> so it wasn't that they were burning more carbohydrate, they were burning more fat. The problem is it's so difficult to study fat metabolism at high intensities. Yeah. yeah. And they used a different method and they showed that, as I indicated, the fastest sprinters use the most fat. So it seems to me that muscles do use fat during high intensity exercise. And I must add that I'm a CrossFitter, and so I've just come from the sure. CrossFit gym this morning, and there they promote a low-carb diet. They do, yeah. And everyone seems to be doing heavy weights and getting really big on those yeah. heavy weights. Yeah, we know a woman. Her name is Brenda Zorn. She's a rock star in our little circle here. She's been type 2 diabetic, has been ketogenic for a couple of years, and she will leg press 10 reps of 800 pounds. Yeah. <laughs> it's a phenomenal amount of weight for a 52-year-old grandmother. <laughs> that is. Un- but, you know, when I watch those CrossFit athletes, I'm just utterly, utterly amazed at what they can do. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Absolutely. So the take-home is don't worry about power. Uh, you know, you may get a little bit of a power from a carb up in the short run, but it's going to be detrimental in the long run. Yes, I think so. And, and you know, the I've... Uh, the guy I converted, who I really like the most, I mean, one of the, my great, great heroes is a chap called Dave Scott, who won the Ironman six times. Right. And wow. two, he was a, a high-carb athlete. Two years ago, he read The Real Meal Revolution. Yeah. And he decided to change. Hmm. And he now promotes the ketogenic diet for all his athletes. And he competed in the Ironman, won it six times on a high-carbohydrate diet and a really high-carbohydrate diet, 80% right. 80, 80 carbohydrate Two years ago, reads The Real Meal Revolution and converts. And he says now it is a much better diet because you recover more quickly. And he simply won't allow his young athletes to go on it. He said, you can get by for 10 or 15 years, but it catches you in the end. By the time you're 40, you damage yourself from all that carbohydrate. Mm. So I've, I've got a question. Um, uh, so uh, let's. Uh, why, why am I gaining weight if I'm running marathons? Oh, because you're you're eating more carbohydrate than you can burn. That's point one. And your insulin resistance and your your insulin is too high. So you imagine me when I'm thirty then I'm thirty one or thirty two and I've got an insulin of forty. Yeah. So all the carbohydrate I am eating is going into fat and preventing me from accessing that fat. I think that's the key. Yeah. That your insulin is so high. And the only way you can get your insulin down is to exercise enormous amounts. And I, and I think it's also then you start to hype, you get hyperphagia, you overeat calories yeah. as well. And uh, I think people differ in how, how carbohydrates drive their hunger. And, and that, that's the key. So you, you're just over-consuming carbs, you're over-consuming calories, you're hyperinsulinemic, and it's all just a big disaster. Great. 
Yeah, so we are, we had a similar response from Peter Bruckner on the same question. So, mm. <laughs> uh, so I, I'm, I'm sure that doesn't surprise you. Yeah. So we want to talk about um, the cost of a low-carb diet, and I know you've been doing some stuff in the townships in South yeah. Africa. Yeah. So, um, so my question is, isn't a low-carb diet an expensive one? Oh, absolutely. It is if you add all the breads and <laughs> use different seeds that for, for making the bread and you don't use flour. Absolutely, it is. And if you want to continue to eat sweet stuff, right? and if you want to eat only the best cuts of meat, that's absolutely correct. What we've done in South Africa through the Noakes Foundation is to set up the Eat Better South Africa campaign. And what we find is the poor people in this country have got the worst diets. They live on sugar and white flour. Yeah. And if you take that diet, that away from that diet, they start to get healthy. Sorry, the third thing they have is packets of medications for their yeah. blood pressure and their gout and so on. And that's pretty expensive. And, and that's expensive. And I was asked in the trial, your diet's expensive. I said, no, 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 no. It's paying for the costs, the effects of the diet, diet that that's what's expensive. Right. And people realize that. So, But we got the cost down to 30 Rand, which is less than $3, probably $2 a day. We were People had enough calories and because they were eating eggs and milk and sardines, you know, pilchards in tin pilchards and liver sure. and offal and mm. vegetables. Yeah. And and those are relatively relatively cheap. So you can do it. Yeah. And then the community got so clever that they were accessing really good fish because they were a fishing community. Mm -hmm. And so they could get cheap fish, which was still really very healthy. So it can be done. But it just it takes it takes effort, and you're quite right. It, for most of us, it would be an expensive diet because we're going to eat the meat and the best meat, and the right. and we're not going to eat offal, and we're not going to eat tinned fish, etc. We think that it's worth people going to their local butcher or their lo local supermarket where there is a butcher where they're actually cutting meat, and the butcher yeah. thinks their value add is trimming the fat off of the cuts of meat, right? But if you go yeah. to them and you say, I want the fat, you know, you're throwing it away. I, I want the fat. I can render it down. I can cook things in it. I can fry in it. Like, uh, it, th we think things like this, uh, being able to, you know, encourage people to go to their butcher, tell them what to say, you know, are, are going yeah. are, are to be beneficial as well. What do you say to people who can't give up fruit because they think it's good for them and they think it's healthy? sweet fruits. Yeah, I was asked that question just today. And I always quote Zoe Harkom, who said that there is absolutely no scientific evidence that five veg and five fruit a day has any scientific basis. It was dreamed up by by U.S. fruit growers and and industry, and it has no, it has no base in science. So the, and the tragedy is, if you look at the dietary guidelines, and in South Africa, we're saying, are we going to prevent diabetes by making people eat more fruit and more vegetables? And, and it's, it's just wrong. Mm. So the answer is fruit is a drug. <laughs> it's, a, <laughs> it's a luxury. Yeah. It's a treat. And you have it once a week, and that means some berries. And yeah. that's it. And the more diabetic or insulin resistant you are, the less fruit you can eat. So I eat fruit once a month, probably. And surely vegetables are good for you, right? Well, there's no scientific studies to prove that, you see. <laughs> <laughs> and so let's start with cereals and grains. Sure. The, the evidence is that randomized controlled trials of cereals and grains, no benefit whatsoever across the board, nothing. Mm. So then vegetables, and then you see they say, oh, it's got, they're full of all these antioxidants. Well, if you're not inflamed, I'm not sure you need those antioxidants. Yeah. Exactly. That's what I say. I don't need antioxidants because I'm not oxidized. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, so the answer is you the, the vegetarian diets or eating more vegetables is not being studied. And the claims that it's going to make us healthy, they're just not there. Well, surely people who go on a vegan diet or whatever, they're also cutting out a lot of processed crappy foods and, you know, anybody who cuts out sodas and excess sugar is going to have some health benefit. But but we, you and Richard and I have met plenty of people who have gone vegan and have and that's brought them to diabetes. Yeah. No, absolutely. Because they actually eat more processed food. That's, that's the reality. Most vegan diets are full of processed foods because they need concentrated calories. 
from mm. processed foods. Right. If you if you're truly vegan and you're just eating plants, you'd be chewing 14 hours a day. Yeah, yeah. And unless to get enough calories, I mean, there you'd be gone back to the primates. Yeah. Sure. Like, and and that's what they have to do. they have to eat for 14 hours a day. Mm. That's a gorilla. Now, mm. if you're eating the same quality of food, that's what you have to do. So. If vegans aren't eating 14 hours a day, they're eating processed foods, which in which the calorie content is dramatically increased by the processing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Incredible. So I've got one here. Um, can a low-carb diet affect mood? In a positive way. I think that it makes you more controlled, more calm. I'm a much calmer person. And it's really interesting. If you ask Dave Scott, he said that he's his – mental state is much better than, than it was when he was winning the Ironman, eating an 80% carbohydrate diet. Wow. And he's, he will tell you that it's because of the healthy fats that he now eats. Mm. And he focuses strongly on those. So I think that, I think it's opposite. I mean, people frequently tell me that they they control their psychiatric conditions much better. The depression is much less. The bipolar symptoms are much less. The autism is less. Yeah. So I just happen to think it's, by and large, it's the, there are very positive results on mood of the start. Awesome. We have a, a, an athlete who's a low-carb athlete, David Pocock. I think you've met him. He's a wonderful rugby player. Am I allowed to spend two minutes yeah. on David Pocock? Please, Please do. Please yes. do, yeah. <laughs> so in 2007, I worked with the Surfing Rugby team and we won the World Cup. You did. And <laughs> I'd helped them by a couple of things, you see. And so... I was praised for what I did by the coach, but not by anyone else. But anyway, in 2011, I was still advising the, the team, and, but they didn't follow what I did until the last year. Then they started following the advice. And they now came into the 2011 World Cup with a, an outside chance of winning. And in the quarterfinals, they play against Australia. Yeah. And the referee is an Australian New Zealander, and he makes <laughs> 46 errors. Oh. And the day he makes. Normally, they make three or four errors. He made 46 sure. errors. And they were all to do with his management of David Pocock. And David Pocock <laughs> got, got away with murder that day. Yeah. Huh. He, and so. Yes, he's a wonderful ferret of the ball. <laughs> I was interviewed half an hour after the game ended. And I said, I don't know how the referee could have called it the way he did. <laughs> that it, it was completely unfair. And I even suggested the game was fixed. <laughs> but that's ah. another story. <laughs> oh, man. They never came back and said it wasn't fixed, so we still don't know. Anyway, so I, if David Pocock had arrived in Cape Town, I would have put a rope around his neck and pulled it very tight. <laughs> so anyway, like about in 2014, 2015, I would guess, on Twitter, David Pocock says you must follow Tim Noakes on Twitter. Huh. And so nice. I, I said, David, I forgive you for everything. You see? So then, <laughs> then I wrote him this long letter explaining how what had happened and how I'd hated him with a passion for four or five years. And that, but now I was prepared to forgive him. And he wrote back. He said it was so funny. And he said the reason he changed was he started reading Western Price. Yes. And then he met my book, Real Meal Revolution. And then he converted to the diet. And he said he'd benefited hugely from it. Hmm. He has a bone so, broth recipe on his own on his blog. Does he? Yeah. So, yes. And whenever he comes to Cape Town, we have a we have a meal together, and we have a long chat. And he's just he's been very supportive of of low carb, as you know. Yes, he's a wonderful human being. He's, I think he went back yes. to school. He went back to university. Took a sabbatical from rugby. That's right. He's taken a year out because he realised if he wanted to be in the 2019 World Cup, he needed a year's break. Yeah. What about stress? Um, do we do we really give stress enough credit for wrecking our metabolism? Probably not. You know, I, I come from the old school where we were told that stress causes syphilis. If you read the textbooks, <laughs> so everything was stress in the old past, and now we kind of got rid of it. The problem is, obviously, you, you can't measure stress, so that that's the difficulty to know exactly how stressed people are. But I'm in a sense, if you talk about our exposure to our lives and all the complexities of life. And if you call that stress, yes, yeah. indeed. On the other hand, you know, stress is really healthy, healthy for us. So it's, it's, it's complex, but I think you're quite right. You know, I'm just reading through some books and they do say that even if the coronary risk factors explain heart disease, they can only explain 40% of it. 
There's yeah. a sixty percent. There's a huge sixty percent gap. We don't know what. There's nothing in that, and, but we never speak about it because we talk about the forty because industry drives us to focus on those forty. Yeah, it's one of these things when the, when you've got a hammer, the whole world looks like it's full of nails. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Most certainly. Yeah. Lack of sleep is another thing that um, contributes to higher insulin levels. I'm a computer programmer, and for about twenty years, my competitive advantage was that I could function on four and a half mm-hmm. hours of sleep a night. And I think that just caught up with me. I think in 20 yeah, years of that yeah. was just, you know, uh, sure, I could do it in the short term, but, you know, in the long term, I think it uh, it caused metabolic uh, mayhem. Yeah, yeah. Now, I think there's a lot of interest in circadian rhythms now and how they go out of sync and then they can contribute to metabolic disease. Mm. So um, I think we've got most of our questions. Did you have one we, more? Carl? Yeah. Can you tell us how the Noakes Foundation started and what its mission is? You say, you know, I've always known that I would be criticized if I wrote books that were critical of other people or of science and if I took the money because then they'd say, oh, you're just funded by blah, blah, or you write books to make money. So I've always given my money to trust and I have two trusts. The one funds a senior researcher in, in mammalian disease in, in, at the University of Cape Town. He's doing the most fabulous work on diabetes in cats and dogs and lions. We have wow. lions that are 100 kilograms overweight and they're diabetic. And uh, we have muscle samples and other, well, muscle samples because these are still living lions. But he's done some fabulous work and, and that relates again to our diabetes research. The Nose Foundation I formed after we, the book Real Meal Revolution did so well. We had a lot of money coming in. I said, I don't want to pay the tax man. Let's put it in the to the Noakes Foundation. <laughs> so we formed the Noakes Foundation, and we've been incredibly well supported by, by altruists overseas. One particular person who I can't mention names, but he's from California. He's been incredibly supportive of our research, and we've been able to do so – we're doing some amazing studies on diabetes reversal. Yeah. In other words, people who have diabetes, we reverse it on the low-carb diet, and we study – what metabolic changes happened in their bodies. And we're looking at the total body to see what changes occurred. And hopefully that'll, that'll tell us what caused the problem in the first place. So that's, that's, but, but that's the one focus is the raising money for research. The yep. other one is the Eat Better South Africa campaign. Right. Because the, the program is so successful. And, you know, within three weeks, we get people off their, di- their hypertension medications. Sure. And that's, Hypertension is such a massive problem in this country, in people who are eating the sugar. And, mm-hmm. and you know, it, it liberates the people because they now say, oh, for the first time in my life, I've got control. Right. I'm in control. It's not the doctor and the pills that are in control. I'm in control now. Yeah. And that makes a massive difference. One thing that we recently learned is the importance of salt and that a lot of people don't get enough salt. Yeah. And uh, especially, you know, those with hypertension think they have to cut their salt. What are they actually doing to themselves? Yeah, exactly. I've also read those books and uh, and the, the data, and I think it's very important. And, and in fact, in the conference today, that very question was raised. Do you need to increase your salt intake if you're on a low-carb diet? Mm-hmm. And we, we defer to Steve Finney, who believes very, very strongly that we have to increase our salt intake. Yeah. So uh, I've, I've got a question about the PURE study. Uh, yeah. Now, uh, you've, you've been quite vocal about the uh, – uh, the Bradford Hill standards of causation, yeah. and when the when the Pure study first came out, there were a lot of people saying, "Ah, oh, well, this proves what we've always said that the low yeah. carb diet was better." And and my first uh, view on it was that it it wasn't significant. I mean, the, the 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 data wasn't significant to to infer causation, except that we are able to f- infer non causation uh, yeah. because of non correlation of saturated fat causing heart disease. So, do you have a comment about the the, the Pure study? Yeah, I th- agree. It's an associational study, and therefore we can't go out and claim that this proves anything. However, it does set up hypotheses, and the the only hypothesis that can come out of that is that carbohydrates are causing the problem, not yeah. fats. And so that fits our model. And you know, there is so much evidence that there are other large studies from European countries showing the more saturated fat, the healthier. The more polyunsaturated fats, the less healthy. Yeah. So it's an it's the reason why it's important is it draws attention to other studies. Like yes. the Monica study, which was done in the 1990s, it showed you could not explain differences in heart disease rates across many countries 
on the basis of differences in risk factors. Mm, and right. that, was, that was just forgotten. And then yeah. there was another study more recent, earlier this year, again, showing that, which I have in the book, showing that more saturated fat, lower heart disease rates. Yes. And more polyunsaturated fats, more heart disease rates. So the evidence is accumulating that it's the carbohydrates, that's not the fat in the diet. That's the problem. Awesome. I, I'm, I'm reminded of the two Ramsden studies uh, where yeah. uh, he went back and looked at two very large uh, clinical trials. One in the Sydney Diet Study, I think, or heart, di- Diet Heart Study, yeah. and the other was Ansel Keys Minnesota Coronary Experiment. Sure. Both studies were pretty much hidden. The actual mm. results were hidden. Yeah, exactly. And certainly the Minnesota Coronary Experiment was completely hidden. And I make a big story of that in the, in the new book because the Heart Foundation still will not – the Heart Foundation in South Africa went straight for me, and they mm. continue at every possible opportunity – to attack me. Mm. And the only problem is you just look at who that funds them yeah. and it's all processed foods. <laughs> right. And and then they will ignore those those studies. But unfortunately, yeah. the evidence is now there that they caused a lot of the problem by allowing us to eat trans fats and promoting trans fat consumption. Nina Teichel says that the whole saturated fat diet heart hypothesis is probably the most tested hypothesis in all of nutrition. <laughs> And it's never been proven to be true. That I address that as well. And that's the inability to understand the null hypothesis. Right, right. And the null hypothesis is if you don't find what you're looking for, it doesn't exist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I make a big point of that because I was attacked by Professor Jacques Rousseau, who yes. headed up the Women's Health Initiative, to debate me in the famous centenary debate at the University of Cape Town. And I made the point, this is the guy who disproved the low-fat diet because he (laughs) was the senior member of the Women's Health Initiative. And he came to South Africa and has done so repeatedly, telling South Africans that they must eat low-fat diet. And this is the man who disproved it. But he will never in his life accept that he actually disproved. So what did they do? They did the ad hoc hypothesis. They added on. Oh, the cholesterol didn't go low enough. The people still right. were eating too much fat. But you can't do that. No. Yeah. And, and didn't Ansel Keys try to publish a paper re- retracting the diet heart hypothesis? And by that time, it was too late? Well, that's what Danella Neal claims. And I think maybe Nina also says that. Yeah. That Blackburn had said that he had tried to say that I got it wrong. Yeah. I wasn't completely right. Yeah. He tried to do a Tim Noakes. <laughs> <laughs> <That's right>. Unsuccessfully. <laughs> Indeed, indeed. So, uh, what kind of um, moral support can you give uh, those authorities who want to do what you did, but just don't have the chutzpah to do it? They want to stand up and rip out the pages of their books. <laughs> yeah, I think you just have to take a leap of faith and, and realize that the, the evidence has changed. And it is going to change. I believe that through Nina Teichel's work in 2020 – the dietary guidelines are going to change. That's what I think. And when they change, then it means the whole teaching of in medical students and to dietitians has to change. They can't continue to be told that high-fat diets are dangerous because the the U.S. government is saying the opposite. So I think that's what's going to happen. And in a few months' time, the Verta Health Study comes out showing that diabetes is reversible in the majority of patients. And that undermines everything we do in medicine because – Insulin resistance is the main cause of all the chronic diseases that we face. It sure and is. And now, if the Verda Health Study shows that you can reverse diabetes with a high-fat diet, that means it's dementia, it's cancer, it's hypertension, it's gout, it's obesity. The whole bang shooting match is right. there. <laughs> <laughs> this is the study that you were hinting at uh, earlier in the year, right? And, and maybe it was yeah. the springtime. You say, there's some science coming out. You just wait. <laughs> yeah. That's that's the one. And I've seen the, raw, the data, and I know it's with publications at the moment. It's being considered for publication. Great. And it's 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 amazing. It's going to – it changes medicine because now – you can't tell a diabetic patient that they've got an ir- irreversible disease. You can't yeah. tell them that anymore. Yeah. And what we now know is it's the treatment that kills patients with diabetes. It isn't the disease. The underlying disease or the insulin resistance is completely manageable, as, mm-hmm. as you've proved, Richard, yourself. Yeah. yeah. So I saw the, the documentary on YouTube with uh, Jay Walkman did about the, the natives in Canada, and you were part of it. 
Um, we are really interested in helping uh, First Nations people, you know, sort of reclaim their yeah. food ancestry and their health. And I thought that was a, just a, a brilliant uh, documentary. And, and can you talk about that, sort of the, the First Nations, the challenges that a lot of these people have? Yeah, indeed. I think that if you look at the, the Inuit or the people living in, in Alaska or in the Arctic or else you take the Plains Indians, yeah. that when the bison were shot out, that was a disaster because then you had these insulin-resistant populations who'd been eating high-fat diets and high meat diets and never exposed to carbohydrates yeah. were suddenly put on these high carbohydrate diets. And the other population is the Australian Aborigines Absolutely. who are also profoundly insulin resistant. They are yes. genetically insulin resistant. Yes. Yeah. And, and what happens is they are exposed to a diet that the Australian dietitian say must contain 40, 50% carbohydrate or even more. Mm. And we know that that's wrong. So that the first nations people are the ones who suffer the most. Yeah. And in my country, the the Nguni tribes who came into South Africa a thousand years ago, they came with their cattle and their goats. Right. And the white man shot out their their cattle as well. And then we had a virus called the Rinderpest came through in the 1890s and wiped out the remaining cattle. And as a consequence, the black South Africans had to move towards the cities where, of course, what did they start eating? Yeah. Well, they started eating industrial diet. Right. And a chap called uh, C.D. Campbell, J.D. Campbell, I should say, he showed in 1950 that the Zulu-speaking South Africans who moved into Durban, into urban area, after 20 years, they developed diabetes, and it was because of the increased sugar intake. Mm. So if you have populations raised on meat and you turn the, convert them to our diets, the diabetes rates are going to rise as they are across the world. So just not designed to eat this diet that we're trying to force on them. We white people seem to be slightly better at coping with this diet. We're not, right. it's not, we, we're just a little bit better and we don't get the same rates. I think in Australia, the rates of diabetes are four to six fold higher in the Australian Aborigines than in Caucasian Australians. Peter Brookman was telling us it's the highest population in the world for type 2 diabetes. And I was watching a presentation by a researcher who was referring to the, the change in, in Aboriginal health between the 1980s, which was not that mm. long ago, but it was exactly. before the, the, the dietary guidelines, and now, and she was referring to the fact that their glucose control had gone out of whack, but they had wonderful glucose control back in the 80s when they were eating their, in this case, were eating their traditional food. And she actually, she showed the, their insulin rates. And if you do the, the HOMA IR calculation on their insulin, they were extremely insulin resistant. Uh, mm. And had high insulin to be able to keep their glucose so low. So it's, of course, you know, yeah. we fed them white sugar and white flour, and 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 you know, took away their their uh, their their uh, native lifestyle by by you know, separating mothers from children, so that they didn't have that that historical reference to their cultural ancestry. And and all of a sudden, we have a diabetes epidemic on our hands, which is horrible. Precisely. Talking to Jason Fung, he mentions the fact that his Asian patients and his Indian, you know, in particular, mm. and the Middle Eastern patients have a higher degree of tofiness. In other words, thin on the outside, mm. fat on the inside. These guys don't have the body fat to protect them. And so you see mm. people that just have the, the fatty liver, the pot belly, but aren't mm -hmm. really obese. And, you know, their A1C is 11, 12. Whereas somebody like me, you know, with uh, European descent, and Scandinavian, especially, you know, uh, I I was 366 pounds, 5'10", and mm. uh, my A1C was 7.4. That's the highest I ever got. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Can you speak to that whole issue? Yeah. So, the, the question is different racial biases towards diabetes. Especially so, Asia. a lot of people wonder whether that's because we – which it's genetics or is it exposure to different diets? If I take myself, uh, there's a lovely study that's just come out showing that at Stonehenge, Stonehenge was built on pork and cheese. And so <laughs> I was born not too far from, oh, sorry, my family comes not too far from Stonehenge. So I think that's what they ate, pork and cheese. And by the way, that's exactly the foods that I like the most. It's, so I suspect that if if you are exposed to these diets, and the further north you come, the more likely it is that you ate high-fat diets. 
Or if you're next to the sea, you would eat more fish. Yeah. And uh, and if, if you're living on an island, there's no wheat and your grains that are going to be grown there. So all the Pacific Islanders are not going to be exposed to carbohydrates until more recently. And that's why the rates of diabetes are so much higher in those populations. Right. I saw an interesting uh, hypothesis that uh, that when, when people made their way from sort of Japan and down into the uh, Polynesian Islands and, mm. uh, and further on. The ones who made it the furthest were the ones who were able to pack on the more e- the, the more energy. So the the ones able to be more diabetic were able to last these long sort of uh, uh, rowing trips from island to island. And so it it kind of makes sense. You know, it's an interesting hypothesis, certainly. Yeah, no, it certainly can... makes a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah. So so one one thing that we that Carl and I were talking about recently was that um, it's very difficult for peak bodies who have uh, taken us down the wrong path uh, to reverse course because there's a lati- there's a, 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 a legal issue there. And one of the things that we thought of was it would be interesting if there was possibly something like a truth and reconciliation process such as happened in South Africa yeah. uh, over apartheid. May, maybe an amnesty on litigation for these peak bodies to enable them to reverse course might be a possibility. That would be a wonderful suggestion, and it's not something I hadn't thought about, but it's clearly something that we need to consider. So I think it's really important because the key why we're all in this is we want to stop people getting killed by the current dietary advice. Right. I got into a lot of trouble this last week because I used the word genocide, and, and I honestly do think that it is mm. a genocide. Yeah. When you think of what happened to the Australian Aborigines and the... Uh, the Plains Indians, to me, that was genocide because it was was. actively removing their food sources. So there's not an issue. But I think that these dietary guidelines, when you go into poor communities in South Africa, as you would in Australia, as I've seen the Australian, those populations are so sick. And what Mm. my dad died uh, from, he lost both his limbs. Mm. Now, we could afford to give him expert help and hospital care. But for most people in South Africa, that's not possible. Right. And once you've got gangrene and peripheral vascular disease, the death is atrocious. And I, yeah. I don't know how they're being cared for. Yeah. And to me, that is, that is equivalent to genocide because we know what's causing it and we should be stopping it. I think that there's a, a big pushback from uh, you know, the, the, the parties involved in perpetuating these myths uh, because it's pretty obvious that their livelihoods, not only are their livelihoods in danger of going away, but their liability would increase if they came out and said, yeah, everything we've been telling you is killing you. It's our fault. Sorry. Uh, you know, the lawsuits and all of that stuff would, would happen, especially here in America. It's very litigious, as I said before. So do you think that we need some sort of protection for these people to align their incentives with actually admitting that they were wrong so that they can move forward without repercussion. And I know it sounds, you know, harsh to say, you know, let's not blame them because we obviously need somebody to blame, but you don't see a conspiracy theory, do you? I mean, I see aligned incentives just sort of falling into line and building on themselves to the point where, uh, you know, sort of ridiculousness that, that mm. it's just protected mm. now, right? So do you think that it's possible uh, that we could do that? I definitely think so. And, you know, your your question about the conspiracy theory, and I say this all along, and I know you'll agree with me, that it's not really a conspiracy. This is business, and business must sell its products. Yes. And we've just allowed them to sell products that are unhealthy and dangerous. Right. And so that's uh, – because I'm always told, oh, you're just a conspiracy theorist. I say no. The sugar industry has a plan, right? Because they have to sell sugar, and uh, they've been allowed to get away with it for fifty or sixty years. But uh, but now it's catching up with them. But I agree with you. We've we've got to do something to get the change to happen quickly. Right. I, I mean, I don't think everybody suing the USDA or the Diabetics Association or the pharmaceutical companies. I don't think that's uh, very wise because now you're just uh, enabling them to double down, you know. Uh, I think the thing that we need to do is give them an incentive to admit they were wrong and so we can move forward and stop killing people. I think that's a very good and maybe we should start on that move. 
to have I, a re- reconciliation commission and we'll put Desmond Tutu in charge. But I think uh, he's yes, totally to agree. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we want to encourage Nina Teicholz because she is sort of working in that area now. Well, Tim, thank you so much for uh, sharing your time with us. We know it's uh, valuable. And uh, thank you so much for doing what you do and everything you've done so far and all the change that we're looking forward to in the future. Thanks, Carl. Thanks, Richard. A great privilege to be on your show. Thank you so much for having me. The privilege is ours, Prof. We're not worthy. We are not worthy. Of course. (laughs) All right. Thanks thanks. so much. Thanks again. Cheers, guys. Cheers. Cheers. Bye-bye. Wow. Okay. I've crossed something off my bucket list now. (laughs) Yeah, me too. Me too. That was – and how how did it feel to talk to your mentor? Yeah, I'm gobsmacked. Yeah. Yeah. Not much to say except that let's eat. <laughs> Time for recipes. Uh, Woohoo! So what do you got, Carl? All right. All right. I've got a very cool Philly cheesesteak meatloaf roll today. Nice. Yeah. And I found a couple of recipes on the internets. Mm-hmm. But uh, the one that is most popular, I think, is called Twisted Food. Okay. And it's just a little video. Mm-hmm. But they didn't, They just did plain old hamburger for the meatloaf part. And, right. you know, meatloaf is so much more than that, right? I mean, yeah. if you ever had a good meatloaf back when you were eating breadcrumbs and all that stuff, mm. the, it's usually a combination of beef, pork, and veal right. with breadcrumbs yeah. and seasoning, mm-hmm. right? Yep. So I'm taking that and I'm meatloafing it up. But instead <laughs> of breadcrumbs, we're using pork rinds. Mm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. So you take two pounds of ground meat. Or mince. Or mince, as you call it. And that can be all beef or a combination of beef, pork, and veal. Maybe a pound of a uh, hamburger, half a pound of pork, half a pound of veal, uh, or just, you know, one and a half pounds of uh, hamburger and a half a pound of pork, no veal or half and half. I mean, it really, you know, yeah. it's up to you. However, you usually make your meatloaf. Yeah. When Carl says hamburger, he actually means beef mince. <laughs> in Australia, yeah, a hamburger okay. is in a bun. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ground beef, hamburger, we call it the same thing in America, sure. whether it's cooked or not. Yep. Uh, okay, so you want an egg mm-hmm. because, yeah, delicious. Yeah. Yep. And a half a cup of ground pork rinds. Now to this, you're going to add some seasonings. I like to use oregano, garlic powder, and I put in cayenne pepper, which yep. is optional. But sure. uh, you can do that if you want. And salt and pepper. Right. Yeah. So you also need some olive oil, some mushrooms, some green pepper, some onion, uh, optional, obviously, it's a cheese steak, so you kind of want onions, but you got to watch them because they can be sugary. Yeah. Uh, about 15 slices of provolone cheese mm-hmm. and 24 slices of bacon. Mmm, bacon. Because mm. <laughs> you're going to wrap this roll in bacon. Of course you that's are. That's how it works. <laughs> yep. Yeah. All right, so preheat the oven to 350 Fahrenheit. Yeah, that's about 180 Celsius. Yep. So chop the vegetables however you like to chop your Mm -hmm. veggies, and saute them in olive oil with about a half a teaspoon of salt over medium heat until caramelized, and then set them aside. Sure. So now you combine the mince, Mm -hmm. or the ground beef, or the ground meat, (laughs) uh, with the egg, the pork rinds, oregano, garlic powder, cayenne, salt and pepper, whatever your seasonings are, Mm -hmm. uh, in a bowl. Okay. Now you line a cookie sheet with tin foil. And spread the meat evenly so it touches every edge. Just spread it out. If it seems too thin, no problem. You can either use a smaller cookie sheet or adjust the size accordingly so that it's not all the way out to the edges. Because, you know, the cookie sheets that I have are pretty big. Sure. Right. So now you layer the cheese on top, leaving at least two inches of meat around every edge. Mm. Uh, and you can overlay the slices of provolone. And then you put the vegetables right on top of the cheese and spread them evenly, leaving the same border around. Right. Now you're going to carefully roll up the meat inside the foil. Obviously, you're not going to wrap the foil <laughs> in the meat. When you roll it up, you just want the entire roll to be inside the foil. So this is going to be like a Swiss roll kind of thing. Correct. Right. Yeah, it's going to yeah. be like a Swiss roll or mm-hmm. a pinwheel or something like that. Gotcha. 
Yeah. Yeah. So in the end, you want it rolled up with the foil just around the edge. Mm. Follow me? Yep. And then you set that aside, and then you place another sheet of foil on the cookie sheet, and you layer the bacon in the same dimensions as your meat was right. so that it covers that entire surface. Now you remove the foil from the meat roll and set that at the bottom toward you know where you are of the bacon. Right. And now you're going to use that foil to roll the bacon around the meatloaf. Mm. But you're going to keep the foil around the entire thing. Sure. All right. So when you're done, the meatloaf should be wrapped in the bacon and the whole thing should be wrapped in foil. I, Follow me? I, I, I am following you. Yeah. That sounds great. All right. Cool. Yeah. yeah. So now you put it in the oven for 20 minutes or so, and then you remove the foil and you bake it for another 30 to 35 minutes. Just to crisp the outside. Crisp the you bacon got up, it. right? Yeah. Yeah, crisp that bacon up. Mm. And then you, uh, you know, let it rest for five minutes or so, and then you slice it. And you, you can, if you have a sugar-free barbecue sauce or you want to make one from tomato sauce, Worcestershire, uh, th- you know, that kind of stuff, you can do that as well. But I, I just like it the way it is. Nice. Yeah, I've got it. I've got this vision in front of me of this uh, massive roll of meat wrapped yeah. in bacon with cheese. With cheese. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Good. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to do That's that. That's what I got. Yeah, I'm going to do that. What do you too. got? Yes, I've got a very Australian one. This is the Oh My God Cheesy Vegemite Taco. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this was actually, uh, this was a video that was uh, shared around on Facebook and I put it on the ketogenic forums and uh, and it, p- people were commenting because, you know, Vegemite is a very Australian thing. It's like a, sure. it's a, it's a yeast spread, but it's very high in B vitamins. And salty. Yeah, it's good for fasting, to be honest. You put it a little bit in boiling water and it's, it's, uh, it gives you that little salty hit. Uh, but yeah. so it's, as I say, it's, a, it's an Australian thing. Uh, it's very difficult to get, uh, in America. When we lived in America for eight years, uh, there was a store we could buy it from in New York, but, um, it, it, you had to know the right place and all the Australians would go there. So, um, Right. If you're not in Australia, I don't really have any good advice for how you can get hold of Vegemite, but if you <laughs> do manage to get hold of it, uh, it's something that you normally put on bread and butter. So you have uh, a slice of bread with a lot of butter on. This is the trick with Vegemite. You want a thin smear of Vegemite over the top of a, a lot of butter. So it's really a con- mm. It's a salty condiment for butter. Uh, and Got it. people make the mistake. They think, oh, well, that's dark and you put it on bread. So it must be like Nutella. So I'll layer it on. And if you grab a mm. whole mouthful of that, <laughs> when you're expecting mm. something sweet, it's going <laughs> to, it's going to be quite a shock. It's a, it's a flavoring agent. It is. It is. So, uh, but of course, we're not going to put it on bread. What we're going to do today is we're going to make Vegemite cheesy tacos. This is actually a vegetarian recipe. Um, and what you do is you start off with two cups of grated mozzarella in two large circles on some parchment paper. And you bake them for five to eight minutes. You want to get sort of a, 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 a golden brown around the outside of the, of the mm. ring, but you want the center of the ring to be still quite soft. Uh, so you bake yeah. these for five to eight minutes at 220 Celsius, which is roughly 430 Fahrenheit. Uh, and then when, when it comes out of the oven, you let it cool for a little bit and then spread it with a, with a smear of Vegemite. Now I suggest going to the link that we've got in the show notes, uh, to actually have a look and see how much Vegemite. If you're not a Vegemite connoisseur, you're probably going to need to, uh, get some, uh, advice from, uh, people who do know <laughs> how much Vegemite yeah. to add. So, so anyway, you, you, right. you spread a smear of Vegemite over these circles of, uh, baked mozzarella. To this, you're going to add four scrambled eggs, uh, and, uh, you're going to chop some cubes of avocado, uh, some cherry tomatoes and a little bit of spinach. And you're going to mm. fold it up like a taco and enjoy it. Now, I've that got to say, good. yeah, ve- Vegemite and avocado and egg and cheese work really, really well together. I bet they do. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like a, a vitamin bomb, too. I mean, think about all the, all the, the B, B vitamins, vitamins the yeah. Vegemite, the potassium, yeah. and the avocado. Yeah, it's good for vegans, yeah. actually, because, uh, m- mind you, you probably couldn't eat the cheese if you were vegan. But uh, for vegans, Vegemite is particularly good because it uh, has all the B vitamins, and vegans have a lot of trouble getting uh, all the B sure. vitamins in. So, um, yeah, that's what I yeah. got. 
That's awesome. And wow, what a show. We we apologize for going long, but we hope you stayed with us. And uh, what can I say? Tim, Tim Noakes, we're not worthy. <laughs> we're not worthy. <laughs> of course, if you have anything that you want to tell us, something we said wrong, something that you don't agree with, some more research that you found to support or refute anything that we've said, send it by email to dudes at 2 com or post it on our website. And you can follow us on Twitter at 2 dudes, on Instagram at 2 dudes, and make sure to use the hashtag 2 dudes. And of course, if you want to join the free ketogenic forum, it's forum2 com. And if useless swag is your fancy, you know, T-shirts, coffee mugs, mm-hmm. and other junk with witty keto sayings on them, <laughs> head over to gear2 ketocom And if you want a shot at getting some of that swag for free, join the 2 Keto Dudes fan club. You'll be eligible to win something in every show. Go to fanclub.2keto.com. And if you feel like supporting all of our podcasts and our forums, think about making a pledge on our Patreon page at patreon2 or just hit the donate button on our website at www.2ketodudes.com or just go to donate.2keto.com. And you can also see all of our podcasts mm-hmm. and other videos, such as the Keto Fest videos, on YouTube at youtube.2keto.com. And if you haven't already, go leave us a review on iTunes. That's how new people get to know about what we do. 2 Keto Dudes is brought to you by 2 Keto LLC, who strives to support the low-carb community with podcasts and other publications. Well, keep calm and keto on, Richard. Yeah, keep calm and keto on, Kyle. All right, and we'll see you next time on Two Keto Dudes. Dudes.